So, uh, our first contributor paper for this afternoon is by Bianca Bellini from San Rafael University. Towards a faithful description of the first person perspective phenomenon, embodiment in a body that happens to be mine. You have 30 minutes for your presentation and 10 minutes for discussion. This talk, this talk aims at uh, providing a faithful description of uh, the first person perspective phenomenon. After clarifying uh, what uh, makes a description faithful, I will argue that uh, Paris and Baker's theories alone don't offer such a description. Nevertheless, they offer some uh, interesting insights about uh, this phenomenon that, along with uh, a phenomenological attitude, contribute to the formulation of a faithful description. According to Mark, let's imagine to get on a bus and see a shabby looking man at the far end. We will probably think something like that is an uncut person. However, when we suddenly realize that the person we are looking at is our own image reflected in the bus mirror, then we will think something like I am that unkept person. The core argument of uh, Baker's group is that naturalism without first person properties is an error. I think that Mark's example enables us to dive right into the first person perspective phenomenon. And the crucial point I'm going to discuss is this. How can the experience exemplified by Mark's case be described in a faithful way? And therefore, how can the first person perspective phenomenon be described in a faithful way? Perry provides a similar example. He says, I once followed a trial of sugar on a supermarket floor, seeking the shopper with the turn sack to tell him he was making a mess. Finally, it dawned on me. I was the shopper I was trying to catch. In order to describe this uh, baffling feeling associated with uh, this kind of the, um, experience, we can distinguish two uh, different propositions formulated by the careless shopper at two different times. Number one, who is making a mess? And number two, I am making a mess. I'm going to argue that Paris thesis enables us to formulate only a partially faithful description of the first person perspective phenomenon. Paris approach, in order to be completely faithful, needs to be completed. And here is where Baker and the phenomenological attitude come to the rescue. Let's now consider the conceptual categories through which Perry tries to describe the careless shopper's experience, similar to that of uh, Max's example. Perry argues that the information obtained by the subject through the first person proposition, I am making a mess, cannot be rephrased into a third person proposition like John Perry is making a mess, without missing an essential information. Furthermore, the two propositions reflect a distinction between two different ways of picking up information about people. Firstly, a self-informative way, that is the ordinary first person way. For example, I am making a mess. Secondly, a role-based way, that is um, a third-person reform reformulation, like John Perry is making a mess. Only after the realization that one is a careless shopper, or the uncapped person, only then the information gained in the first-person perspective is linked to the information gained in the third-person perspective, and the two shoppers' beliefs are no longer detached. This linkage causes the change in beliefs, and uh, this change determines Perry to stop following the trial 
and rearrange the turn circle. Perry, in order to explain this change in behavior, devises the distinction between belief and belief state. According to him, in fact, the crucial thing about essentially indexical beliefs is the role they play in explaining behavior and making predictions. And this distinction between belief and belief state concerns the difference between the way one believes a belief first or third personally, and the belief's content. It's the belief state that explains behavior and that needs to be inherently indexical. This entails that explanations of the careless shopper case or of the uncared person case cannot be given in terms of what is believed, but have to include how the belief is believed. Perry's argument lets us to claim that, according to him, the impossibility of translating a first-person perspective assertion into a third-person perspective is epistemological and pragmatic. This means that the first-person perspective has only a pragmatic significance as far as it's the action perspective and an epistemological one as far as it's the cognitive perspective that persons can adopt on themselves. Now, the crucial point is, can Paris' description be conceived as faithful to the first-person perspective phenomenon? Before answering this question, it's necessary to identify which criteria a description should meet in order to be conceived as faithful. Only after establishing these criteria I will proceed to verify whether Paris' description satisfies them or not. And in my opinion, the phenomenological attitude towards a given phenomenon ensures the faithfulness of the phenomenon's description. As Scheller has clearly stated in Phenomenology and the Theory of Cognition, phenomenology is neither the name of a new science or of a new method. Phenomenology is an attitude of a spiritual seeing in which one can see and or experience something which otherwise remains hidden. And what is seen and experienced is given only in the seeing and experiencing act itself. This means that a, a philosophy based on phenomenology must be characterized, first of all, by the most intensely vital and most immediate contact with the world itself. That is, with those things in the world with which it's concerned, and with these things that they are immediately given in, in experience. That is, in the act of experience, and are in themselves there only in this act. Therefore, I think it's possible to regard a description of a given phenomenon as faithful if and only if. First, this description is consistent with the phenomenological epoche. It means that when approaching a given phenomenon, it's necessary to bracket what one knows about the concerned thing apart from what appears of it within our experience and seeing. Secondly, a description can be considered faithful to a given phenomenon if it is consistent with the immediate experience that one has of this phenomenon. Third, a description is faithful if it is consistent with the phenomenon's appearance and transcendence. Every kind of thing has, in fact, a specific way to appear and to transcend its appearance. For example, persons has, have a specific way to appear, that is, physiognomy, and to transcend their appearance, that is, the knowledge we have of other people or of ourselves. And the transcendence of the phenomenon is not its reality, but its entirety. Finally, a description is faithful if it is consistent with the essential traits emerging from a phenomenological scene. And a phenomenological scene is, on the one hand, an approach to the phenomenon that puts into brackets all the previous information 
one has about it without deriving it from an immediate contact with the phenomenon. And on the other side, a phenomenological scene is looking for that essential traits which make this phenomenon exactly what it is. Now, in the light of this criteria of faithfulness, does Paris' analysis about the first-person perspective satisfy them? I think that it meets the first criterion, as it's possible to evaluate the faithfulness of Paris' account only by, uh, only by putting into brackets Paris' position. It has a third-person naturalistic ontology. I think that uh, Paris' analysis also meets the second criterion. In fact, the experience of being the careless shopper is well explained by Paris' description. One who had this experience would in fact consider Paris' explanation faithful to her experience. Nevertheless, I think that the third and first criteria of faithfulness are unsatisfied by Perry. The appearance of the first-person perspective phenomenon, in fact, includes also a physical component, the body, that is the physical and personal bearer of the first-person perspective. And none of Perry's conceptual categories enables us to identify the fundamental role played by the personal body. But this physical component is an essential trait of the first-person perspective, but Perry doesn't recognize it. Nor does he recognize other essential features of the first-person perspective phenomenon. Therefore, his description is unfaithful. And the crucial point is that these other essential features that Perry fails to recognize seems to be acknowledged by Baker's account, especially the distinction between the two states of the first-person perspective and therefore the notion of self-concept. Consequently, Baker's approach contributes in a valuable and fundamental way to the formulation of a faithful description of the first-person perspective phenomenon. Now, Baker's approach towards the first-person perspective seems to consider the priority of the first-person perspective as ontological as well as pragmatic and epistemological. This ontological priority prevents sentences formulated in a first-person perspective from, be from being translated into a third-person perspective. Ontology is conceived by Baker as the inventory of all that exists. It includes every object and property needed for a complete description of reality. And Baker conceives the first-person perspective as an inalienable and irreducible property necessarily belonging to ontology. She says, in fact, as long as a science has no room for anything first-personal, Ontological naturalists must read reality of the appearance of first personal properties. The way to read reality of unwelcome phenomena is to naturalize them. The main goal of this book is to show that the first person perspective is not naturalized, either by reduction or by elimination. And I will heartily agree with this argument. As I mentioned earlier, the distinction between the two states of the first-person perspective and therefore the notion of self-concept are essentially traits of the first-person perspective. And in order to understand the necessity of these features to achieve a faithful description of this phenomenon, let's consider how Baker analyzes the experience of the unkept person that we saw earlier. She says, in fact, he didn't realize that he was the unkept person referred to. He was referring to himself without realizing that it was himself he was referring to. Soon, Mark realized that it was himself whom he was looking at. It was only then that he also was able to say, I am that unkept person. And because Mark had a robust first-person perspective, with that realization came a raft of others, 
I know, think, believe that I am the tankard person. Or perhaps I wish that I didn't look so untapped. As we see in the case of Mark, once a person has a robust first person perspective, then his simple assertion using I are connected to I sentences. I think that this description seems to be more faithful than Perry's. Perry, in fact, identifies only some essential traits of the first person perspective phenomenon such as the epistemological and pragmatic priority of the first-person perspective and the distinction between different ways of picking up information about people and also the idea of linkage. But the point is that these features individuated by Perry, individuated by Perry are surely essential, but they aren't the only ones. Baker investigates Perry's approach. Baker's description of the careless shopper's case seems to be more appropriate than the one offered by Perry. This is because Baker makes use of her own conceptual categories concerning the distinction between the two states of the first person perspective and the self-concept. In regard to the criteria of faithfulness earlier illustrated, Baker's description seems to be consistent with the experience one has putting himself or herself in the careless shopper place or in that of the unpacked person. I will now briefly consider the two main criticisms that Baker addresses to Paris' analysis. I agree with the second criticism. However, I think that the first criticism provided by Baker against Perry seems to miss the mark. Surely, Perry doesn't give a non-first-person account of what linkage is and how it happens. This means that he doesn't offer a third-person reduction. For this reason, his project of a first-person perspective's naturalization collapses. As long as the contradiction is within Perry's system, Baker's is right. Anyway, my aim here is the formulation of a faithful description of the, face of the first person perspective phenomenon. And if Paris naturalism, along with a phenomenological attitude, is put into brackets, and if Paris' argument about the pragmatic and epistemological priority of the first person perspective is acknowledged as faithful, then it becomes evident that it's unattainable to demand from Perry to provide an account of the linkage in a third-person perspective. Surely, Perry gives an account of the first-person perspective that ends up being inadequate to his reductive needs. But more importantly, his account turns out to be partially consistent with a faithful description of the first-person perspective phenomenon. His account isn't consistent with all those criteria of faithfulness discussed earlier, and the same, I think, applies to Baker's account. Her description, in fact, doesn't embrace an essential trait of the first-person perspective, that's the phenomenological distinction between light and corporal. For this reason, her description, I think, is not consistent with the phenomenon's appearance and the transcendence and with the essential features emerging from a phenomenological scene. Although Baker argues that the first-person perspective needs to be embodied, my disagreement with Baker's theory lies in the way in which Baker conceives this embodiment. As I said earlier, Perry doesn't recognize the significance of the physical components. Whereas, according to Becker, the bearers of the first-person perspective are embodied human persons. A human person is, in fact, necessarily constituted by a body. Becker says, in fact, we whole persons are constituted by whole bodies. And so, the subject of experiences is the whole person which isn't reducible to her brain, mind, or body. And these aspects turns out to be a fundamental trait for a faithful description of a first-person perspective. 
but the crucial point is the thesis according to which, although we are essentially embodied, we don't essentially have the bodies that we now have. This entails that the person has essentially a body, not the body belonging to her. Granted that the body has to provide the mechanisms supporting the first person perspective, this body can be made of anything. Going down this road, we might therefore end up to be constituted by non-organic bodies. In fact, Baker says, what is required for our continued existence is the continued exemplification of our first person perspectives, along with some kind of body that has mechanisms capable of doing our brains do. This implies that we are fundamentally persons who necessarily are embodied and who have the body that we have only in a contingent way. In short, according to Becker's theory, we are constituted by our bodies and the bodies that constitute us now are organisms. With enough neural implants and prosthetic limbs, we may come to be constituted by bodies that are partially or fully non-organic. The property of being me is the property of being this exemplifier of a first-person perspective. It's being this exemplifier of a first-person perspective that makes me me. Basically, Baker's thesis seems to lack a definition of the constraints of the bodily variability, which are aimed at preserving the personal identity. Baker's approach seems to lack a distinction between like and corporal, and the distinction and the absence of this distinction makes her description of the first person perspective phenomenon an incomplete account. The crucial point is that um, another body, perhaps non organic, wouldn't support my first person perspective because it wouldn't be me. This aporia in Baker's theory can be clearly understood by considering the embodied experience deriving from playing a particular kind of game, partially similar to Max and Paris examples. Let's imagine to play in this game. Sitting around a circular table, we lay our hands on it, and then move our right hand to the right of our playmate's left hand so that one's left hand is located to the left of our playmate's right hand. Now, in turn, everybody has to lift up their hands so that all the hands are lifted up in succession, one after the other. <laughs> Playing this game is rather puzzling because one is easily tricked into forgetting to lift her hand up, waiting for um, the playmate sitting next to her. And what happens is that it's as if you, you feel that your own hand isn't yours, but your playmate's. It's possible to describe this baffling feeling associated with the, this game, distinguishing two propositions formulated by the forgetful playmate. One, why is the other playmate not lifting her hand up? And two, it's my turn. I am not lifting my hand up. In this case, the analogy with Paris careless shopper is evident and drawn on purpose. The experience of being the forgetful playmate cannot be described in a faithful way, neither through Paris' conceptual categories nor through Becker's. Surely, some conceptual categories conceived by Perry are useful to partially describe the forgetful playmate's experience. But none of them enables us to find out about the fundamental role played by the personal body. Similarly, Baker's proposal also fails to shed light on the baffling feeling associated with this game. Her approach allows us to grasp only some essential traits of the first person perspective. In this way, it's not understood how the forgetful playmate's experience is firstly an embodied experience, which inherently concerns the phenomenological distinction between life and corporal. 
the difficulty in explaining this feeling makes the peculiarity of this game case clear, especially if compared with Paris case. The latter can be clearly illustrated by Becker's theory. However, if we try to figure out what happens in the game case to Becker's conceptual categories, we don't succeed in understanding thoroughly why we don't immediately lift our hand up when it's our turn. In the game case, it seems impossible to understand the reason of that puzzling feeling unless we are minded to recognize that it's not sufficient that the first person perspective is embodied in a body. It's necessary that the first person perspective is embodied in the body that's mine. Not a body that happens to be mine and could be someone else's, but a body that's mine. My first person perspective is embodied in my body, in that personal body that's the bearer of the personal perspective on the world of life. To ignore this aspect means abolishing the distinction between life and corporal, which enables us to understand how the assertion, it's my turn, I am not lifting my hand up, would lose its meaning if we don't establish the constraints of the body's variability. And that puzzling feeling is therefore possible because the first person perspective is embodied in my body, not in a body that happens to be mine, but just in that body that's mine. In Becker's view, the person is just embodied in a body whose main task is supporting the first person perspective. This implies that the physiognomy of the personal body is completely disregarded. The person is not essentially characterized by her body. However, the physiognomy of a person is what strikes us first when looking at a person. Baker's account, despite being more, um, bet uh, despite being better than Paris' description, is unfaithful to that essential features emerging from a phenomenological scene or the phenomenon's appearance itself. A specific phenomenological attitude, therefore, enables us to discover that faithful description we have looking for. Nevertheless, the phenomenon's transcendence itself suggests that the individuation of the first-person perspective essential features cannot be limited to this research. As a matter of fact, it demands a continuous exercise of phenomenological seeing. To ignore the distinction between life and corpor means to ignore the distinction between body's appearance and transcendence. The body as a physical body, as a physical object, represents the transcendence of the body's immediate experience, appearance. It has the experienced body. This priority of the experienced body is clearly explained by Husserl. Der Leib zu Leib als Leib und als materielles Ding auftritt. That is to say, the experienced body appears immediately as an experienced body and as a physical thing. It's the experienced body that can be conceived as Leib or Körper. And the experienced body is the experienced foundation of what everybody calls mind and I. Leib and Körper are two sides of the same coin. The first person perspective is necessarily embodied in a Leib, which necessarily is a Körper. Without the notions of Leib and Körper, it seems difficult to formulate a faithful description of what happens to the forgetful playmate. Quite differently from what happens in the example of the careless shopper and of the enquête person, the game case involves the personal body in a more specific way. A description of the first person perspective that aspires to be faithful to the phenomenon itself has to examine this first person bodily experience. So, to sum up, the dialectic examination of the different accounts offered by the phenomenological attitude and by Paris and Becker's theories has allowed us to give a faithful description of the first person perspective phenomenon. Therefore, we can say that 
there is no first person perspective without my body and there is no bodily self without first person perspective. What is at stake is that the body in which the first person perspective is embodied is my body. As long as this main feature is recognized, it's possible to formulate a truly faithful description of a given experience under examination, such as the one of the careless shopper, of the unhappy person, and of the forgetful playmate. Thank you. paper and I must say I don't know I had to pass an exam in German but that's as far as I ever got. I did know those words at one point um, but uh, um, I w wanted to say that it's just not my view that that it's my view that what makes a body my body at some time is that it constitutes me at that time that is it's not that I, there's a body such that that body constitutes me at all times. It's that for any body X, what makes X my body is that at T at some time, is that it constitutes me at T. So that's what my view is. And, but I, and I don't understand why I would be leaving out something if I had my view instead of your view. My disagreement. Um, uh, my disagreement um, regards uh, um, your thesis about the idea that although we are necessarily embodied, we don't have uh, the body that we now have. And the point I think that the body that we now have is my body. And if my body uh, would be made of anything. Uh, for example, a, a bionic um, body. I um, don't understand how I could uh, um, recognize that body as uh, uh, the mind body. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, but I think that that Mister in this case would actually be a bit closer to uh, Baker than you've allowed, insofar as. The demands of the epoche, his anti-anthropologism would say that uh, you know a körper and Leib has nothing to do with uh, with biological matter. I mean, those are already irreal uh, uh, objects or experiences by virtue of, of the reduction, uh, and as such, it's entirely possible for uh, metal, for silicon, to be both körper and Leib, uh, because this has nothing. I mean, phenomenology has nothing to do with humans in a sense. It uh, you know can do with angels, Martians, gods, uh, fictitious characters. Yes, Roberta. No, I, I, could I suggest also to, to this uh, objection? Uh, well, I'm not, not sure huh? that there's no connection uh, within we, 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 between uh, uh, like a Kerpa, and so because Kerpa is something belonging to the uh, ontological region physics, uh, and so uh, there is no connection between Kerpa and life, so uh, the physics are biological and the personal. I do think that there is a connection in Husserl, and this is exactly provided by the relation of Fundirum. This is one example of that possible uh, ontological connection uh, which is, uh, in a way, uh, much, much less than logical and much, much more than, than just, just contingent. I mean, in, 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 in that sense, I mean, uh, what really the only possible variation of your body, recognizable as your body, I mean, not only recognizable, could it possibly be your body, the body of blame, when it would be, for example, the body of top? because uh, you, you, you had done a kind of rock and you change. I don't know possible to accept that as, a, as, as part of your identity, ontological part of your identity. I mean, not that I couldn't recognize you if you, if you told me, but look, I seem to be Tom, but I'm in fact lived. Okay, but uh, this 
I would find ontologically contradictory, so to speak. <laughs> uh, no. yes. And this is exactly my uh, difficulty regarding your um, idea of uh, uh, constraints of body's variability. Would you say that again? That uh, what said uh, Professor uh, De Monticelli is uh, exactly uh, my difficulty in, in understanding um, which criteria, uh, which constraints of body's variability we can accept according to your theory. So, Lina, pardon me, it was my fault. <laughs> it was your fault. Yeah. Uh, so, I think that the bo my body, the body that I have now, what is my body, and I can test that out by th seeing what body moves if I think I'm, if I'm going to scratch my head. I'm going to raise my hand and scratch my head. As this hand goes up, that's my body. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, talk because your um, you address it to a topic that is also an interest of mine, and it was also a problem by reading Lynn Baker's book. Uh, this uh, idea of embodiment uh, also doesn't satisfy me. But I, I, th I think we can also respond to this problem with a, um, thinking on image and imagining as a faculty uh, that let us think of a possibility of ourself even in a body that is not our present body. So I think to uh, solve this controversial, we can also formulate, uh, I would say, a phenomenology of imagination. I think we need a phenomenology of imagination to solve this question. This is my, my personal perspective on, on the problem. Uh, because I think that it is a part of self-experience, the possibility of imagining ourselves in another body, uh, even a mechanical one. I, I mean, otherwise we wouldn't we wouldn't have so much research on uh, neurotics, neurotics, uh, and so on. So I think this is a very interesting point to discuss, and uh, it is a um, suggestion to you to introduce in your theory a theory on self-image, not only on self-concept, but also on self-image. This is a suggestion. <laughs> Um, my crucial um, idea that I uh, didn't found in uh, um, your main claim um, sufficient stress of uh, minus regarding to the first person perspective and uh, to the body that we now have. No more time for questions and replies. So, can thank Yanka again.